Thank you for having me. I am Pranav Rajpurkar and I am a PhD candidate over in the Stanford Machine Learning Group. And today I thought I'd share three opportunities for AI for, uh, to improve medical diagnostic testing and walk you through three research examples from the Stanford Machine Learning Group as case studies of these. So the tradi traditional model of clinical practice today can be thought about as three different steps, diagnosis, prognosis, and treatment. In diagnosis, we're concerned about asking what happened to the patient. In prognosis, we're concerned about predicting what will happen to the patient. And in treatment, the doctor is concerned about deciding what action to take. With AI applications, we will see all three of these steps being transformed over time. So imagine a world in which a machine is responsible for interpretation of medical images for diagnosis, prediction of mortality from electronic health record, and prediction of a treatment that's specific to an individual rather than a treatment that is common for all people. And AI has been making progress on all three of these areas. Today we'll focus on diagnosis, which concerns with providing an explanation for a patient's health problem. And of course, this particular decision informs subsequent healthcare decisions. The diagnostic procedure begins when a patient experiences a healthcare problem. At some point, they might decide to engage with the healthcare system, go to their doctor, at which point the main bulk of the diagnostic process begins. And this can be summarized as doctors and other healthcare um, stakeholders using information gathering to update their working diagnosis for the patient, ordering test A, updating diagnosis, test B, updating diagnosis. And this is communicated to the patient, at which point treatment can begin. And of course, this loops back into getting more information to update the working diagnosis for the patient. Let's imagine a world with AI in which this diagnostic process might look a little different. Rather than a patient experiencing a healthcare problem before they engage with the system, can we have AI provide alerts even before a problem is experienced? Rather than having a patient decide that they want to call their doctor or even bother their doctor with something that might not be totally wrong with them, how about have a mobile diagnostic agent com communicate with the patient? The information gathering step could be tailored to particular patients um, using their history, using their genetic profile, rather than ordering the same set of diagnostic tests for every person. Communication of diagnosis is one place where healthcare often fails, but what if we had diagnostic assistance take place um, of that coordination and communication within doctors and between the patient, their family, and their doctors as well. Finally, on treatment, one big problem is adherence to medication. Can we have AI make an impact there? Let's focus on the information gathering step itself because this is a major source of diagnostic error right now. If you ask a doctor to boil down this process, it would divide into four different aspects. The first, which is taking a clinical history and interview, performing a physical exam second, sending a patient for referrals or consultations, and then the last one of obtaining diagnostic testing. And this is a complex part itself, which involves deciding what test is the right test to order, and after ordering that test, to interpret it. Let's focus on that one. Over the past 100 years, diagnostic testing has become a critical feature of standard medical practice. Mammograms of the breasts are a common diagnostic test, so are ECGs of the heart. Diagnostic testing can be broadly categorized into two categories, pathology and radiology. And pathology further breaks down into lab medicine and anatomic pathology. 
Let's take an example of each. So lab medicine will deal with testing of fluid specimens, such as blood and urine, while anatomic pathology is dealing with testing of solid specimens, such as tissues and cells. Radiology allows us to look into the human body, look at sections of the human body through imaging technologies like x-rays, ultrasounds, CTs, MRs, and more recently, PET scans. What do we imagine this world will look like with AI? Some examples of things that are already going on. In lab medicine, deep learning is being used to classify white blood cells from microscope images. Uh, we can use AI to automatically detect if a cancer is metastasized to the lymph nodes. We can look at chest x-rays and automatically decide what pathologies does that chest x-ray or set of chest x-rays have. With AI, there's another part of the diagnostic testing world that's being more and more enabled, and this is mobile health. And with mobile health, the idea is to be able to continuously monitor health in a way that hasn't been accessible to doctors just because of the amount of data and the frequency with which it is generated. So one question that you might have in your mind right now is what's new about AI? Why haven't we solved these problems in the last 10 years or 20 years? Why is now the right time? So the traditional machine learning framework can be divided into two parts. There is training and there is prediction. And in training, the usual setup is there is some labeled data, X and Y, and a machine learning algorithm is used to learn the mapping from X to Y. Then come prediction or testing time, there's data that doesn't have any labels going into a machine learning algorithm that is trained, which is used to generate a prediction. Great. Traditionally, this has looked like the following setup. There's an input. It could be an image of a car. And then there's a person responsible for feature extraction. What do I mean by feature extraction? Let's say I wanted to learn to recognize a particular type of medical image. I might go to a doctor and say, hey, how do you recognize this particular pathology? They might say, hey, edge detection is important. So I might design a filter on top of the images which makes the edges more prominent. Might extract those, then feed that into a machine learning classifier which can ultimately use that processed extracted features to get to the outcome. And this has been the traditional regime of machine learning for a long time. The bottleneck here has been the person sitting on the chair. The bottleneck is human time and creativity that goes into that feature extraction step. But what's happened over the last seven years is that deep learning methods have been able to eliminate the feature extraction step by saying, here's an input, which might be an image, it might be an audio signal, and we can go straight to the output without having this extra feature engineering step. And this change has been enabled by lots of data, by lots of computation, and a few algorithmic tweaks to old algorithms that weren't working that well when we didn't have that much computation and that much big data. One question I get asked a lot is, well, what's the next paradigm shift that's about to occur in deep learning? A lot of what ML engineers do is still make a lot of engineering decisions of how to design, how to feature engineer these neural networks now. So rather than feature engineering of data, it's now moved into network engineering. A lot of decisions are about how, to, how many layers to have in a network, how to go about choosing the right optimization algorithm for training the network, how to choose data augmentation methodologies. And all of these are still decided manually and often through heuristics which may or may not be that good. And the trend increasingly in deep learning has been to automate that away, to make all those decisions automatic rather than having people decide, engineers decide what those should be, have data decide, make those decisions. So now that we've seen the paradigm shift that AI has brought about, what are some opportunities that AI has in medical diagnostic testing right now? The first opportunity that I'm going to talk about is in continuous monitoring of health. 
Let's take arrhythmias, for example. So arrhythmias refer to an irregular beating of the heart, and it is a condition that affects up to 3 million people in the U.S. every year and affects a lot more worldwide. One of the most common arrhythmias is atrial fibrillation, which alone affects 33 million people in the world and costs a lot of money to treat. Arrhythmia detection has come to the forefront of public attention with devices like the Apple Watch, which are able to now automatically monitor whether a patient has atrial fibrillation in their heart rhythm. There's evidence to suggest that continuous monitoring of a patient's health, including their heart rhythm, would reduce the morbidity and mortality associated with heart disease. And paired with automated real-time detection, this would have big societal benefits and big health benefits in terms of being able to save lives. We did some work in the lab that I'm about to share with you on detecting arrhythmias uh, from ambulatory ECGs. So traditionally, the ECG test shows the electrical activity over time has been done in hospitals. And the way it's set up is lots of electrodes are attached to different parts of the body. And over a few minutes, the electrical activity of the heart is recorded. But it turns out that catching arrhythmias from a few minutes is often insufficient. What is often required is tracking of the patient's heart activity for a long duration. And so Holter monitors came about and are prescribed by cardiologists uh, who tell their patients, go home, wear this device for 24 to 48 hours, and let's find out what might be going on. More recent devices have gotten smaller and now the extent of just being a patch on the chest which can monitor for up to two weeks and a patient can press a button if they feel a symptom. Let's look at the difference in the amount of data this generates. The heart beats about 1.6 million times in 14 days. This is a lot for a cardiologist to actually manually go through and this is a real call for being able to do ECG interpretation automatically to figure out what's going on. But of course, is that a question? Yeah. Uh, it's very common for uh, ECGs to also do um, trivial stress tests. You are, are you guys going to cover any of that? Sorry, so you're saying uh, treadmill tests? Yeah. Yeah, so there are, there, so the question was, so ECGs are also used for treadmill tests. Do we do any of that right now? Uh, not in this particular study. Here we were looking at ambulatory ECGs, which were uh, prescribed to patients by cardiologists um, who were wearing this, this particular patch. So time instead of a stress test. So in this particular case, there is no stress test, although these patients could have been doing any activity while uh, their activity was being monitored. Cool. Thank you. And uh, feel free to ask more questions. This can be very interactive. All right, cool. The first challenge. So um, going back to your previous slide, you said it's very difficult um, to analyze the results of this. Um, an arrhythmia is a very easily observed pattern. And um, most of the systems now actually are, uh, there's one that you didn't show, which is a little smaller than the whole, all smaller than the whole, but bigger than this, that actually has a communications capability. It's essentially a, a special purpose cell phone. Mm -hmm. And uh, they don't seem to have any difficulty yeah. identifying a fibrillation. It's, it's, it's not something that's, it's obvious. It's, you, can, you can scan, you know, even somebody who's untrained can scan many lines uh, of waveforms and it's automatic, it jumps right out at you. Great, okay, so uh, if I can recap your point, uh, there are many available devices right now that are able to do automated ECG interpretation. Um, can we not do that already? What was, what, what was the study actually new or what was going on there? So it turns out, and hopefully I will convince you of that by the end of the section, that this is actually a very hard task to be able to distinguish between various types of arrhythmias 
And we have some numbers on how well cardiologists perform at the task as well. Yeah. So the first challenge in automated ECG interpretation is the amount of signal that we're dealing with. Consider the difference between a 12-lead ECG and a single-lead ECG. So a 12-lead ECG is the traditional system, which is done in the hospital bed, where you can see there are several electrodes attached on the left. And on the right is what is called a single-lead ECG, which generates one signal. Now you can think about having multiple leads versus having single leads as having multiple perspectives into the 3D electrical activity of the heart while a single-lead ECG only gives one of those perspectives into the heart's electrical activity. The second challenge is that the differences between heart rhythms are often subtle. Um, the ECG consists of repeating cardiac cycles, and each rhythm is identified by looking at features within a cycle and between cycles. Uh, so within a cycle, there's the P wave, which roughly corresponds to the atrial electrical activity, the atrial contraction, and then there's the QRS wave, which roughly corresponds to the ventricular electrical contraction, and there is the, the recovery phase, um, which is represented by a T wave. And here's what the normal sinus rhythm looks like. Um, it's defined by characteristics like having 60 to 100 beats per minute, having a P wave, the small one, before every QRS wave, and having a narrow QRS wave. And these. It hardly looks normal. That's a STEMI on the way right there. Sorry? That's a ST elevated myocardial infarction, infarction going on right there. Um, <laughs> the graph tells it that. Yeah, no, that's, that's great. I'm glad, I'm glad you caught that. I might have copied the wrong picture. Uh, but I'm not, a, I'm not a cardiologist, but my model is, so maybe I'll pass it into my model later and, and figure, uh, figure your confirmation. The second type of rhythm is an ectopic atrial rhythm. And the way this is distinguished is that there is a different P wave. And EAR and sinus rhythm are the two most confused rhythms. And they're, they're very easy to confuse because they have a very similar morphology except for the P wave. The third challenge is that different rhythms have different levels of seriousness. So Confusing between EAR and sinus is not clinically meaningful because EAR is a benign arrhythmia. But if the rate, if the heart rate was higher than 100 beats per minute, then it's not EAR, it's supraventricular tachycardia, which unlike EAR is treated by doctors and cardiologists. When we started off this project and looked at what people had done in the past to do automated ECG analysis, we saw that the bulk of the work was focused on feature engineering approaches. And this included uh, figuring out the right um, discrete wavelet transforms and continuous wavelet transforms, but each of these were very rhythm specific. You wanted to know what rhythm you wanted to identify a priori. And for a different rhythm type, you would have a different set of parameters with a different mother wavelet that would help you identify that particular rhythm. And then there was a lot of pre-processing that went into it, including bandpass filters, but these, one has to engineer the right thresholds, and then there's a bunch of domain knowledge that went in, like looking at the interval between the two R peaks, um, or the amplitude of the R peak itself. We took a different approach. We said, let's take the raw ECG signal and a raw list of rhythms that that ECG signal has such that each rhythm uh, corresponds to an equal section of the input ECG signal. And then use a neural network to do the sequence to sequence task to map from X to Y. So we use a 1D convolutional neural network where the convolution is over the time dimension of the input and then we have a 34 layer deep network. Now, a neural network is a function and the more the layers there are, the richer the function is. And the richer the function is, the better it should be able to fit to the training data. However, when people were going deeper with neural networks, they were finding out that 
the deeper networks were actually having a larger training error than the smaller networks. But this shouldn't be the case because the deeper network should have a richer solution space. So they found out that this was because the optimization of the deep network was poor. One of the ways that it was proposed to solve this problem was to say, okay, we will add these shortcut paths in the network. And what these shortcut paths will do is they will reduce the number of hops it takes for the error to propagate from the last layer to the first layer. So the, now the function we want to learn changes slightly, where if the original function that we wanted to learn was um, f of x, now we're learning f of x, excuse me, if it was h of x, we're now learning h of x minus x. Uh, so the structure of the neural network changes a little bit, but there are no extra parameters. An extension of the work figured out that the fewer the operations on the path of the shortcut connection, the better the network optimizes. So on the left, you can see there is a ReLU nonlinearity, while on the right, the only operation that takes place is the addition operation. And um, that one performs better because there are fewer things in, path, in, in the path of the shortcut. Another idea that came about was the use of dropout within these residual blocks to make these networks generalize more. Um, the way to describe dropout is um, it's like, uh, if you're a Marvel fan, it's like the Thanos of neural networks, where half of the neurons uh, within a layer are dropped. And one interpretation of this is that you can think of it as an ensemble of different models. So we collected data from uh, patients wearing this ZO patch that had been continuously monitoring their, their, um, their heart activity. And we got this from about 29,000 patients. We got 64,000 ECG records of a total of 32,000 minutes. And this was 600 times bigger than the previous data set that had been used for arrhythmia detection, which is the MIT BIH data set. And for each of these sequences, we had ground truth annotation provided by a clinical ECG expert who decided here's where rhythm A ends and starts, and here's where rhythm B ends and starts, et cetera, et cetera. And then we collected a test set. And in this test set, what we did was we had a committee of cardiologists decide, okay, what is the ground truth that we're going, going to go for? And this was set by the committee. And then we took a separate set of cardiologists and we put them in individual rooms and then measured their performance by having them annotate the test set as well. So now we can have a comparison of how well cardiologists do and how well the model does. So how close do we get to experts? Um, so here is uh, the results displayed on an ROC curve. So the ideal point to be on this graph is the top left corner, um, where the y-axis is sensitivity, which is how many, um, how many of the patients that have a particular uh, condition do I catch? And then there's one minus specificity, which deals with those who do not have the condition. Um, and the top left corner is ideal, and you can see that the model is a curve, and that curve is generated by looking at different thresholds um, of the model. So I decide anyone over 0.1 probability decided by the model is considered to be a positive prediction, and all the way from 0 0.01 to 0 0.99, and that's how that curve is generated. And what we're looking to find is whether the cardiologist points, which are the red points, and the green point, which is the average, lies lies below and to the right or above and to the left, where below and to the right means that the model is at least as good, if not better, than the cardiologist, which seems to be the case in uh, three of these examples that I've drawn. The first one is atrial fibrillation, which is the, one of the most common serious arrhythmias here. Question. So you, if, if I understand correctly, you're only measuring true positives. Um, You're measuring whether or not true positives are captured. Is that correct? 
So if you're not measuring false positives. That's specificity. That's so yes. So we are measuring both of them. So sensitivity would be along the axis of uh, that would include true positives and it would include false negatives, and then the specificity would include true negatives and false positives. How would you know that one of the individual doctors wasn't better than the committee of doctors? Yeah, so that's a great question. Uh, we don't. Uh, we, could, we could make a guess that three cardiologists and a committee would be better than one, uh, but really there's, there's, there's no way from this to tell, uh, to tell whether there was a single cardiologist who would have been the absolute gold standard. Um, what is increasingly being done in this is to figure out using a, using a richer diagnostics test to set the ground truth and then having the test being done on a less, uh, a less rich diagnostic uh, um, test like, like ECG interpretation. But in this case, it's really the committee that's deciding. Um, but one point I think would be, is, is interesting here, is Assuming the error rate reduces as one goes from one cardiologist to two cardiologists to three cardiologists, then I think it can be shown statistically that it's sort of um, how probable it is that um, the model it performs as well as several of these uh, experts making some assumptions about the data. Were there, were there other models to throw away? Were there other models? This 3 of 12 or 3 of 30 or 3 of 150? I mean, these three examples. So these three examples are three classes, uh, three types of arrhythmias. And I'll show you on one of the future slides um, how the performance was across all of them. Okay. Yes? Um, how much time was given to the panel of doctors and to the algorithm you were running? That's great. That's a great question. So how much time is given to the doctors and to the algorithm? So to the doctors, they were not given a time limit. They were just asked to, asked to um, make the annotations until, until they completed um, the test set. Uh, for the algorithm, um, how long it took to generate predictions for all of these uh, was within a minute. Your model is better than all the doctors. How do you know that left hand corner is actually true? So how do how do I know that the left hand corner is actually true? And top corner, because the doctors looks at it and says it's not problem. <clears throat> yeah. But your system says it's a problem. Right. Who so, confirms that it's a problem? Sure. Yeah. So if. Uh, if the model is outperforming each individual, how can we even measure that with, with sort of high confidence? How do we know that's correct? So here the ground truth is set by a committee that's able to discuss things with each other in case they have disagreements. So we're assuming the ground truth provided by a committee of cardiologists against which each of these individuals is being measured um, is going to be more correct than any individual cardiologist. So it's just an assumption that we make that this is how well, you know, a, um, th this is sort of, and, and I think one of the other ways of measuring the ceiling of this would be to have two different committees and then measuring the agreement between two different committees. And that would provide a sort of, uh, um, sort of Bayes error for, for the top left. Okay. Great. When we looked at where the mistakes were made on a confusion matrix, uh, here's the model on the left side and the expert on the right side. Um, and by experts, this, is, this takes the average over all of them. See that one of the most common off-diagonal points is the, is the difference between EAR and the sinus rhythm, which we saw earlier was um, a source of confusion, but one that isn't clinically meaningful. Here's another one that's interesting. So there are two rhythms. Uh, there is uh, IVR and VT. And uh, one of them is benign and the other is dangerous. And uh, one of the differences between the model confusion matrix and the expert confusion matrix is that the model makes less of a mistake of calling something benign when it actually can be dangerous. 
Here's the performance of the algorithm and the cardiologist uh, as measured by the F1 on, um, on all of the different rhythms that we were looking at. Um, another advantage of the model here in terms of its performance was that on different types of hard blocks, it was able to get a good score and also on the most common serous arrhythmia, which is atrial fibrillation. So the first opportunity we talked about for AI to improve medical diagnoses was in continuous monitoring of health. The second one is in reducing medical error. So in 1999, a report came out by the Institute of Medicine that estimated that 44,000 to 98,000 people die in U.S. hospitals as a result of preventable errors. Question. Two questions regarding the, say, the, the, the outcome of the previous section. Yeah. What would be, well, how would you qualify the general reception from the doctors you work with and the committee you work with in terms of the results? Like, were, were they very surprised? Is it, is it something that they were expecting? Or? Yeah, so, yeah, so that's a good question. What was the, what was the reception from doctors of this particular um, of this particular experiment. Um, I think in general, the way doctors feel about um, these automated ECG interpretations, that there have been a lot of studies about these, is that they're just not accurate enough. And they're good for some of the things, but really need a manual review to go through and say, okay, this is exactly what's going on. And uh, this study, and there, there are a few others like these now that look maybe particularly at atrial fibrillation, um, had, a, had more of a sense of, okay, this could be done automatically now. I think more of a reception uh, was given to Apple's uh, EKG release to the general public uh, because that's something which is already in use by real patients as opposed to something which is done in a controlled lab setting uh, where it's easier to get these kind of results uh, because we know exactly what our training distribution is and we know our training, our test distribution is also similar to that. Um, so I think it was convincing that this was, a, this was a good result, but there needed to be lots of work done to actually make sure this would work generally. Great. So this was the 1999 report. Turns out it underestimated the severity of the problem. More recent analysis has calculated that a mean rate of death from medical error is up to 251,000 patients per year, which puts death from medical error as the third leading cause of death in the United States after cancer and heart disease. In terms of diagnostic error, turns out, yes, that's kind of a purple heron, because you're including um, people giving the wrong medication. You're including people dropping patients when they're moving them from one device to another. You're including people operating on the wrong patient or you're operating on the wrong limb. I mean, the types of medical errors go way, way beyond anything that you could address. Yes, uh, you're absolutely. Uh, Maybe somebody else is more, has got better information on this than I do. Yeah, no, that's a fair point. So just to, just to repeat your point, uh, the sources of medical error are large. It just doesn't just come from diagnostic interpretation errors. It can be from uh, communication of the error between, uh, between sorry, communication, uh, miscommunication between specialists and between primary care physicians. Uh, it can come from the wrong medication, it can come from not, not following, not adhering to the medication. Uh, so there's a large, um, large variety of things that are going on here because it's a complicated I, I system. Yeah, sure. We could do that at dinner time. Perfect. Great. Um, but one of the big sources of medical errors are diagnostic errors, and there's been research spanning decades here and uh, looking at a variety of different things. There's postmodern examinations, there's review of the medical records um, that show that diagnostic errors do contribute to a large percentage, a non-trivial percentage of patient deaths. Specifically looking at radiological interpretation, um, 
This is one study that was done at the MGH where uh, there were readings performed by experienced abdominal radiologists of exams they, had, they or their colleagues had read earlier. Um, and the finding was that their disagreement with others, with their colleagues, was more than 30% of the time and with themselves was about 25% of the time. Here's an example, an actual example of a case in which a misread x-ray of a patient that had pneumonia led to respiratory failure and death. And just to summarize, uh, the patient goes to the express care clinic, has a chest x-ray taken, it's interpreted as negative, um, realizes later that um, the x-ray is read and, um, excuse me, realized, it was later realized that the patient had pneumonia, which was uh, manifesting in their chest x-ray, and the clinic calls the patient, but by the time they get to the ED, the patient has died of respiratory failure associated with the pneumonia. So talking about uh, pneumonia, one of the things that we've done in the lab and are working towards is being able to automatically interpret chest x-rays and make radiograph diagnoses using deep learning. So chest radiograph interpretation is critical for the detection and management of acute thoracic diseases, including pneumonia and lung cancer, which affect a lot of people. And this time-consuming task requires expert radiologists to be able to read the images and make the interpretations. And this is a big problem in parts of the world where access to radiology and radiologists is limited. The chest x-ray examination is one of the most common examinations um, done and includes uh, having two views of a patient from the back and from the side to get an insight into what's going on inside the lungs. And the way radiologists go about interpreting these images is um, looking at abnormalities which present mostly as areas of increased density, um, also called opacity. Here's an example of one of the pathologies, which is pneumonia, which most commonly manifests as consolidation, which in layman's terms is a fluffy cloud that one can see on the chest x-ray. And pneumonia occurs when the alveoli, the air sacs, fill up with pus. But the alveoli can also fill up with cells or with blood or with fluid, in which case it's a cancer or a hemorrhage or an edema. And these can mimic the appearance of pneumonia on these chest x-rays. So here we take a chest x-ray and we're going to build a model which can output the probability of a bunch of different pathologies and have a convolutional neural network, this time it's going to be 2D, over these images. And the model is going to be pre-trained on ImageNet, and we're going to use a dense net architecture. So earlier we talked about shortcut connections. Shortcut connections help with optimization, and that's what the residual network's work found. The dense network took that to an extreme. It said, okay, we know shortcut works instead of adding shortcuts between these particular set of layers, what if we added shortcuts from every layer to every other layer before it, taking that idea to the extreme? And turns out, for the same number of parameters, dense nets are able to achieve a lower validation error than their corresponding resonance. When we started work on this problem, the NIH released a large data set of chest x-rays consisting of 100,000 images from 30,000 patients, which was the largest public data set at the time of release. Each of these x-rays was annotated for the presence or absence of 14 different thoracic pathologies uh, using natural language processing on the radiology reports. And then a validation set of 420 frontal view chest radiographs was selected. Uh, for radiologist annotation, where the majority vote, this time of three cardiothoracic specialists, serves as the consensus reference standard for each image. To evaluate human performance, this time we have six radiologists individually annotate the test set. Now we note in this case there's no access to patient history or prior examinations, which is important for a lot of these interpretations and we only have frontal radiographs, no lateral views, so this is not a, uh, a completely 
this is not a this is not a comparison which mimics clinical practice, but it's an approximation of uh, of that. So when we look at how well the model does, how well the radiologists do, um, the same setup of having uh, sensitivity plotted against uh, one minus uh, its specificity, but the axis goes from one to zero. So being on the top left corner is again ideal. And the, uh, the algorithm is the purple line, and uh, the green line is generated by uh, spline averaging the, the individual radiologists. We can see here that on a lot of pathologies that the model does as well as the radiologists are doing. Putting it on a table, um, we found no statistical difference on 10 out of these 14 pathologies. On one pathology, atelectasis, which, uh, which is a partial or complete collapse of the lung and is often sort of a post-surgical thing to evaluate, uh, the algorithm did better. And on other pathologies like emphysema or hernia, the radiologists uh, still perform significantly better. One of the questions that comes up, not just in this particular case of chest x-ray interpretation, but more generally in medical imaging interpretation or in the use of AI models for these tasks, is how can we trust the model? How can we trust that it's making decisions for the right reasons? One of the ways people have been approaching this problem is by generating heat maps over the image that show where the algorithm is looking to make its decision. And one method for that is the use of class activation maps. Here's what class activation maps generated from the algorithm on these chest x-rays look like. So on the top is an image of a chest x-ray with uh, lung cancer with two masses um, in, in either lung, and we can see that the algorithm is able to highlight those as it's making its decision. At the bottom is a pneumonia that the algorithm is able to catch accurately. So the goal here is to be able to improve healthcare delivery, help radiologists prioritize workflow, reduce diagnostic errors, and to increase access to medical imaging expertise globally, where right now two-thirds of the global population, estimated by the WHO, lack access to radiology diagnostics. So you, you keep using global population, but your data sets are taken from the United States population. Yes, that's right. So uh, a good point is uh, we're, we're talking about um, increasing access to um, radiology globally, yet our data set is from, is from the U.S. And um, that's very much something that, that we're working on making uh, generalizable from the data sets that we've worked with to the data sets that are out there. Um, and uh, one important research question is how well does the generalization happen from data sets here to data sets worldwide? Um, so what I thought I'd show uh, right now is a demo of this particular uh, use case. And, you know, when, when people do chest x-ray um, interpretation in many parts of the developing world, um, it's often done on films. It is not done with a digital workflow. The question is, can we imagine, can we build towards a world in which I can take a picture of an x-ray with my phone give it to the algorithm that's uploaded to the cloud, and then generate a diagnosis right from there. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to demo you the app right now. Okay, so that's my phone. And uh, what I'm going to do is pull up a chest x-ray here, so I, I already know the label for this one, so this is an enlarged heart. And uh, let me just make it bigger. And on the left you can see my phone screen, so let's just make that clear. Okay, cool. So I'm going to position it so that the x-ray is, is here, and I'm going to make sure I don't get too much glare. And I capture all of it. Good. Okay, so this is my chest x-ray, 
And uh, you can see the corners are a little cut off. By the way, this is a chest x-ray that I got from just Googling uh, this particular pathology. Not at all in the training set. I don't know if it comes from, the, from America. I don't know if it comes from another place in the world. And what we're going to do here is... Um, That's all right. Okay, and so we're going to take this uh, picture and we're going to upload it. And it's running through the model right now. And within a few seconds, it's come out with its interpretation. So on top here is cardiomegaly, which refers to the enlarged heart. And you can see a little thing on the corner there saying, uh, very likely. So its interpretation is, um, is correct in this case. If we scroll down, here's another pathology, says it's unlikely, another one that's unlikely, here are a few that are very unlikely. Great. And the idea is that we are working towards making this accessible such that one doesn't need to have a digital radiology workflow to be able to use algorithms like this, but instead it's with a snap of a phone. The third opportunity that AI has in improving diagnoses is to assist in medical decision making. And here, throughout the diagnostic process, there's an opportunity to support clinicians and patients uh, to be able to improve this experience. Let's talk about clinical decision support tools. So clinical decision support tools have been used in uh, a variety of different places within healthcare. Uh, one of them is radiology, where the promise has been of computer-aided detection. And uh, one of the use cases of that being screening for mammography. But dis despite this acceptance that CAD will make a difference, there has been mixed evidence demonstrating its effectiveness. And challenges are that for the use and acceptance of these diagnostic decision support tools in clinical practice, they need to be used only when appropriate, they need to be understandable or interpretable, and enable clinicians to quickly determine the level of urgency or relevancy. And of course, there's the potential patient safety risk of that a clinician could be over-reliant on the decision support tool that would, in a way that would reduce their independent clinical judgment and critical thinking. And there was one study that found that clinicians can override their own correct decisions, in this case in 6% of the cases, due to erroneous advice from the decision support system. So in the lab, we took a stab at this question to try to understand, okay, we're developing some of these AI models, people are developing lots of these AI models, how can they assist interpretation made by radiologists? Here we looked at uh, knee MRI, so MR of the knee is the standard care modality to evaluate knee disorders, and more musculoskeletal MR examinations are performed on the knee than any other part of the body. And we asked the question first, can we identify knee abnormalities at the level of radiologists, focusing on detecting abnormalities and also the two most common uh, abnormalities specifically, which are the ACL tear and the meniscal tear. And the setup of if we showed radiologists the output of the model, just one number, the probability of whether the algorithm thought there was um, a ACL tear a meniscal tear or an abnormality in this particular image, would they be able to make better diagnoses? Uh, so just a little bit of a setup into what goes into a model. So when going from 2D to 3D, everything sort of expands. So rather than having one image now, we have three sets of images, which are the different ways of looking into uh, the 3D anatomy of the knee, which are the sagittal, coronal, and axial uh, series. And then for each of them, we have, um, using each of them, we output a probability of abnormal of ACL and a meniscal tear. And note that these don't sum up to 100 because they can all co-occur. This is a multi-label problem, not a multi-task problem. 
and we're going to train nine convolutional neural networks this time for each view and within each view for each pathology and we're going to combine them with the use of logistic regression. The idea here is to put each image within a series through the same set of layers to extract features and then combine them through the max pooling operation to generate an output probability. So we trained on 1,300 uh, NEMR exams from Stanford and we validated on 120 where the majority vote of this time three musculoskeletal radiologists established the reference standard. And we found that in terms of performance, uh, the model did really well. But that wasn't what we started out with. We started out with the question of how well would radiologists now do at this? So one, one thing is, are we looking at the right thing to be able to make the diagnosis we looked at interpretation earlier? And here we can see the model highlighting the part of the image where it thinks uh, there's an abnormality and if you were to ask a radiologist to make this interpretation, they would say that it's, um, it's able to localize correctly. Um, here's another example where it wasn't trained to identify these particular abnormalities, uh, but in this case is able to anyways. Um, a note on the external validation. So one of the points that was brought up earlier was we know that these models, yes? So I was just curious on this, this uh, MRI thing. Why did you use three uh, 2D images in different directions rather than the 3D data set and have it kind of you know, use whatever plane is best in a 3D data set? Great, yeah. So I'll repeat the question. So why use a uh, several 2D models rather than have a 3D model that's able to incorporate all of them. Uh, so that's a great point. And use of a 3D model will be able to uh, get information along the Z dimension as well in a way that 2D models just aren't able to capture. Um, the reason we went for 2D models in this case is twofold. One is that it's straightforward to use pre-trained models when they're in 2D. And the second one is them is that it takes up less memory. This was also a task in which we realized if we started with the 2D approach and saw that it didn't work that well, we could always move on to a, designing a more complicated 3D approach. But it was interesting enough to test the hypothesis of does the z-axis actually matter right now, or can we make these predictions independently on each frame and combine them. One of the points that we touched on earlier was the need for these models to generalize beyond the population that they were trained on. This was trained on Stanford. How well would it do if I took examples, uh, in this case from Croatia, on patients who were scanned from a different scanner um, with a different protocol at a different hospital? It turns out that just applying the model without any tuning was able to achieve a AUC of 0.824, um, which, is, which, is, um, which is relatively good. The best published results on this particular data set had been 0.894, so we got close. And even that one uses semi-automated approach. So there was some ne need for a radiologist to do some segmentation before that model started working. When we fine-tuned our model on this particular data set, we were actually able to outperform the previous best approach. So there is some gap that's needed to be bridged to be able to apply these models to different institutions and different uh, countries, but it seems like we're some of the way there, and hopefully we can, we can go further with even more newer techniques. The real question we started this project with was, would radiologists actually do better with AI? And the way we set up this experiment was we had experts read the same cases twice, once with the model help and once without the model help, but with a 10-day gap at least in between. And when we saw the performance across the three tasks, 
and uh, on specificity, sensitivity, and accuracy, we found that in terms of, in terms of performance, um, assistance helped increase the specificity for ACL tears. So what this would mean was if there were 100 patients who did not have an ACL tear, we would send five fewer people to surgery. The utility of this is to help reduce unnecessary testing and surgery and give quick preliminary feedback for patients whose exams come back as normal. So the di diagnostic future with AI um, is hopeful. There are many ways in which AI can change the experience of the diagnostic process for patients and for doctors, and there's a lot of work to be done there to make this transformation happen. The work that I talked about today has been made possible by um, a lot of collaborators, both in the med school and in the Stanford Mission Learning Group. Um, and of course, I'm, I'm thankful for, um, for um, my lab and Professor Andrew Ng for, for making that possible. So thank you for having me here.